Welcome this morning to a study of probably the most neglected book in all the Bible. Uh, we are not neglecting it. And if you're visiting with us, I can't tell you how important it is for you to keep coming uh, back to see us and to worship God and to study His Word. Um, we could do a sermon series on why you should do that. Uh, we can't do that now. But we hope that you'll receive a good welcome. We pray that your time here will be uh, well spent and that God will be glorified because of your presence. We're studying the book of Revelation and uh, we are introducing the book and it's certainly true that no matter what book you're studying, a book well introduced is a book half taught. But especially this one. It is so maligned, it is so misunderstood, it is so neglected. It's interesting, years ago, some years ago, many years ago, I was preaching one Sunday for a congregation. Uh, I guess this was while we were in Knoxville. And uh, I sat in the auditorium class before I was to preach in the worship hour. Um, don't know if it was in Knoxville, might have been in the surrounding area, somewhere in an American city, somewhere. You ever been anywhere? Probably more than I'd like to be. But I was attending the auditorium class that Sunday morning, and uh, and at the end of that class, uh, the Book of Jude. Well, no, I guess it was the book of 3 John was finished. And the, uh, the teacher announced that, uh, that next week they would begin a study of Jude. And then he asked the class, well, after we finish Jude, what would you like to study then? And a very quick answer, I mean, just cat quick, came out from the audience, anything but revelations... <laughs> Now, to be honest with you, I think that's the first time I've heard that stated in that way. But that idea has gone on in our brotherhood for years and multiplied thousands of times. Many people don't believe that they can't understand this book. My goal in teaching this book is to get you to understand, and the light won't come on until the end, probably, if you hang in there with me, how easy this book really is. And I'm going to say that so many times, probably, in the course of the study, that you're going to be totally sick of it. But I believe you're going to find that out. What makes the book difficult for us, for our 21st century American year? What makes it difficult? There's not complex concepts in this book. The basic idea of this book is remain faithful through trials, through temptations. You're going to win at the end. And the book of Revelation is taught in seven different cycles and repeats that same idea over and over and over again. What makes it difficult and why we tune it off so quickly is the apocalyptic language. What is the Greek word for revelation? Apocalypse. Apocalypsis. The uncovering, the unmasking, the revealing. And this revealing, this unmasking was done by John. If you were here last week, you know that was on the Isle of Patmos, an island about 70 miles southwest of Ephesus, one of the seven churches to whom the letter was written initially. And this was a place of banishment that I strongly believe, I guess I'm showing my hand here before I really want to get into it, a place of banishment that Domitian would send heretics, Christians, many of them. 
John was able to outlive all of the other apostles. He was the oldest of all of them. Because he was not killed immediately, but he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. And by inspiration, the Holy Spirit allows him to see this panoramic view, this play, if you will, of the book of Revelation. And oh, how dramatic it was. How dramatic it is. You know, I, I've noticed in my life any, uh, any play that I've gone to see, sometimes it's like a movie, but, but plays especially. Every single minute detail, I don't understand in that play the first time I see it. Am I different that way, or is it that way with you? No matter what play it is, there, there is something that I don't get Usually more than one thing I don't get until I see it another time. And then if I see it a third time, boy, I'm telling you, I'm getting it now. <laughs> the book of Revelation is the same way. Many times before we can even get through it one time, this language scares us away and we want to go do something else. We want to go read James. <laughs> Bless your heart. How many times have you read James in your lifetime? You know why you read that probably more than any other book? It is just the opposite of Revelation. It is so practical. It is so unapocalyptic. It is so right there. It doesn't take a lot of time to read the book of James. It doesn't take much effort to understand the book of James. And that's why when someone who has absolutely no or very little exposure to the Bible and they say, which book should I read first? I guarantee you, I've never told them the book that you and I are studying now. <laughs> but I suggest read James first, and then read Mark. Of the Gospel accounts, that one is the most clear, the most concise. I don't tell them to read Luke first, you know why? Those are long sermons. We all know what we think about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't study Revelation. Not once will that enter our minds anymore because we are setting the stage, no pun intended, to see this great play unfold before us. But there's some introductory work that we must do. And by the way, um, I, I've had a couple ask if, if they haven't been in the class so far. Are they hopelessly behind in the book? And I told them, no, we haven't begun the text yet, but we have discussed some vital introductory matters that it's, that it's very important that they get. And uh, as you can see, our beloved brother Bert is up here in front with a camera. And that means that you can have ready access to, to all of this. And uh, before I give you notes and things at the end, and by the way, we are going to hand out in probably a couple weeks this little glossary, which comes in very handy of all the symbols in the book of Revelation. And when you uh, go through the text, when you come up to uh, Armageddon and beast from the abyss and the beast from the land and the sea beast and the black horse and the bowls of wrath and, and the crowns and the dragon and the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and on and on and on and on and on. You can plug in the answers. These, these are cleft notes for the book of Revelation. Uh, you may disagree with some of these cleft notes. That's okay too. Of all the commentators that I've read, I don't know that I have agreed 100% with any of them. But you don't have to. Let me, uh, let me nail down now <coughs> some uh, concise, that I believe to be very good commentaries on the book of Revelation. And uh, some of you have asked about these. So you're one of these cleft notes already. That's, that's okay. Uh, probably one of the best was written by a Baptist minister. His name is Ray Summers. He is, uh, he is not a premillennialist, 
as you will readily see at the beginning of this, but it's called Worthy is the Lamb. And uh, I think you can get this on Amazon for about 12 bucks. The best 12 bucks that you will ever spend on a commentary in all of the Bible. Per word. Very good. How many of you know or have been familiar with Brother W.B. West from Hardy Graduate School in Memphis? He's now passed on. But right before he passed on, he was able to finish his commentary. And it's entitled Revelation, which is so important here, through first century glasses. Very, very important. Very good. Uh, Leon Sandcliffe wrote a commentary entitled Victory in Jesus, which is, is good. Uh, Homer Haley from Florida College, from um, our anti cooperation uh, brethren, wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. It is an excellent one. The Denton Lectures, I'm not sure what year this was, uh, 1984. Uh, different uh, preachers in the Brotherhood uh, wrote different sections of and presented different lectures on the book of Revelation, simply entitled Studies in the Revelation. Uh, very good. Commentary. Revelation, the Revelation of Christ, a teacher's guide. When I read this, I didn't understand why necessarily it was a teacher's guide instead of a student's guide. But uh, I guess he wanted to uh, get the attention of those that would be going to study it and teaching the book of Revelation. So I guess that's why I called it a teacher's guide. I thought it was just as good a student guide as it was a teacher's guide. And then uh, Jim Waldron wrote a, uh, a commentary, just simply entitled A Commentary on the Revelation, The Lamb and the Lion. The Lamb and the Lion, which is uh, also very good. So any of those that might interest you, I know some have asked, it's hard to say which one. Probably if I could only pick one, it'd be the first one. He's worthy of the lamb. The last two weeks, we talked about some factors that have prompted the writing of the book of Revelation. And what were a couple of those factors that we mentioned? What was the, the background of the book of Revelation? What's, what's, what's the main thing that's occurring? It's so important to understanding this book. Persecution. persecution, yes. It is a book bathed in the background of persecution. And uh, who were the persecutees? Christians. And where were these Christians? Where were these Christians? Good. Very good. Not just Rome and the city of Rome. They were throughout the Roman Empire. To whom was the book written initially? And don't say Christian. The seven churches of Asia. Not the continent of Asia. That's not what, uh, that's not what is uh, in mind here. But the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is southeast of Turkey, west of the main block that you and I know as um, Asia today, uh, of Asia Minor. Oh, okay, so Christians in the first century were the persecutees. Who, were the, who was the persecutor? And, 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 and as many of you say this as is possible, because it's going to tell me where you date the book. <laughs> That's always good to know. That's always good for the teacher to know. I should have handed out a, a little questionnaire. Uh, because the, the reason is that the outlook of the book takes two very different forks. You know what Yogi Berra said about a fork in the road, don't you? Thank you. Yeah, we, good. We have a baseball fan here. <laughs> when you come to a fork in the road, Yogi said, take it. <laughs> <laughs> if you know Yogi Berra, you would appreciate that. <laughs> the book of Revelation, in, in the very outset, takes a fork in the road. Well, and then it can take some more forks. But the major fork at the beginning 
is who the persecutor is. <laughs> when this occurred, because if one takes uh, the opposite fork that I take, then many of these symbols will change. And when considering both ways, this one makes so much more sense to me, and I hope it will to you too and as we go along, and I'll be really interested to have your input on this. But who do you believe, and just, you know, just, I want to hear, just tell me, uh, who do you believe the persecutor is in the book of Revelation? Wow, he went even a step further. Yes, I do too. I, I, I believe that the specific, I was looking for a more general idea. Uh, Rome is a persecutor, Domitian in particular. But some date the book of Revelation earlier. If you believe it's Domitian from Rome, then you are a late dater of the book of Revelation, like at the end of the first century. Now, the reason why this is so, one of the reasons why this is so important, mainly in our brotherhood of yesteryear, the early date was promoted, basically because of one of our old champions. Have you ever heard of the name Foy E. Wallace Jr.? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> great man. Great debater, great preacher, great in many ways, and I believe you really miss it in the approach in the dating of the book of Revelation. Another reason why I ask this and why this is so important among us, there was a very, very prominent commentary, a one-volume commentary that was brought to Bible classes. And maybe you brought it at one time. I don't see it around much anymore. But uh, interestingly enough, it was written by a preacher in the Christian church. Have you ever heard of B.W. Johnson, Johnson's Commentary? Johnson's Notes. Johnson's Notes. Yes, I forgot. Yes, it had notes on Johnson's Notes. All right. Um, good little, well, a little bit bigger than Ray Summers, but a good, concise commentary on, on the New Testament. It was just the New Testament commentary. Um... He took this view of the book of Revelation. In fact, we're going to talk about four different approaches after one decides what main artery to take here as far as the dating of the book earlier or late. Then one has to answer the question, well, what approach do we take after taking one of those two major approaches to the book of Revelation? Is it a continual historical approach, which means... That as you look at the book of Revelation, each section is a part of history as it goes down through time. That's how Hitler gets into the book. Because a part of the book of Revelation would deal with the, if you are a premillennialist, next to the end times, or if not, the end times. And the book reads just like a continual historical account of the history of things. I don't want to get into that right now. We will, either the end of this class or next week. I don't believe that's the way the book of Revelation was written, but B.W. Johnson so thought. If you believe the Domitian and Rome is the persecutor of Revelation, then you date the book at the end of the first century, somewhere around 8096. And we're going to talk in just a minute why not only the external evidence, but the internal evidence of the book, I believe, heavily weighs that view. Heavily. In fact, we're going to deal with some of the reasons why others date this book before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, around AD 68, which would mean then who would be the leader of Rome. Who was Rome when Peter wrote? The one you're probably, the Roman emperor you're probably the most familiar with. 
Nero. Yes, Nero. But Nero would not have been the main persecutor, according to this position. The main persecutor would be, who do you think? Who persecuted Christians other than Romans? The Jewish Jews. The Jews. Yes. In particular, the leaders. Yes. And so when you look at the book, you would not view Domitian and his cronies and the government of Rome as a persecutor. You're going to view it an extension of Jewish persecution. And Jewish persecution were the first persecutors of the church, right? The Jews are the ones who got the Romans. The Romans would have never crucified Christ by themselves. It was the Jews that prompted all of that. And the Jewish persecution was first, so the Jewish persecution was more emphasized in AD 68. And so therefore some think that the background and the context of the book of Revelation falls earlier under Nero, but more precisely under Jewish persecution. But there's only one problem with that. One, well, there's more than one, but there's one big problem with that. Neronian persecution had not, when there was, when there was Neronian persecution, it didn't happen outside the confines of a certain section. It didn't go into all the provinces. It wasn't as widespread as it was under Domitian. And one can hardly read this book to think that this persecution was, was confined to a certain small area. And hopefully we will see that soon as well. There has been a Donnybrook, so to speak, over dating of this book. But whichever position you might take, and whatever position I might take, those differences, surely we understand that those differences shouldn't divide us now because of pride and because of a, a desire to be right and to win arguments. Some of those uh, discussions have gone further than they need to go, but we can still agree on the major theme and thrust of the book, no matter if you are an early dater or you are a late dater. Um, I want to look at the early date first, right, and give some reasons given for the, um, for the promotion of the early date, and then I'll have something to say quickly after each point why I don't believe that's a good reason. Now, this is important. Um, if you haven't really gotten into the revelation, you might not at this moment understand the importance of this. But we won't go very far in the text before I believe you really grasp why this is important. So, just hang in there. Number one, from an old version of Scripture, the Syriac version, there is a witness that Nero banished John to Pat. Of course, the late date would say Domitian banished John to Patmos. This argument, which once had force, but now basically is known by biblical scholarship generally, is based upon the title statement in the Peshitta version of the New Testament. And it goes on to explain that this version did not date from 8125 as was earlier thought. Other evidences have come to light since that that commentary, all it really was, in the Peshitta version dated from 411, somewhere around 411, to 435. And so, therefore, those things that were said before of that statement were known without further commentary, if you will. 
concerning the dating of that book. And so it is with any ancient documents. When other evidence is found in the later writings, not that the later writings is absolutely and necessarily correct, but when taken together and, and considered together, very likely uh, that which was written later could shed some light on uh, what the conclusion would be. Uh, another reason why some date the book earlier was the impending persecution according to the visions of Revelation. And as we know, in other parts of Scripture, when referencing the coming of Titus, the Roman general, on the destruction of Jerusalem, what verbiage is usually attached to that? Oh, it's coming quickly, it's coming shortly. Get ready. Matthew 24 even talks about, here are the real signs of the times, folks. The signs of the times for the coming of Christ figuratively in the sense of of Titus and the Roman army upon the destruction of Jerusalem, the real signs of the times are given there in Matthew chapter 24, not to the end of the world. The signs of the times for the second coming of Christ is that everything's going to happen normally. People are going to be marrying and giving in marriage. People are going to be born. People are going to be dying. Everything's pretty much and it's interesting, the things that are perhaps more attached to the second coming of Christ have gone on forever. Children will be disobedient, be disobedient parents. Well, how long has that been going on? <laughs> I didn't happen in my generation, but at least since my generation. Um, those specific signs were referring to the coming of Titus on the destruction of Jerusalem. Specific. But in the book of Revelation, we're going to see this time is fast approaching. These things will shortly come to pass. Well, that's no necessarily a proof for the earlier date, because guess what? The things shortly came to pass in the first part of the second century as well. And even into the middle of the second century. There was impending persecution, but it's probably more true of Domitian than it is of Nero. Domitian persecutions were pressed into the provinces, not Neronian persecutions. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, which we will get into in a week or two. I know I keep saying that says the time is at hand. Well, this would be equally true of the 96th date as it would be for the 68th date. Much persecution is said by those who date the book early was Jewish instigated. And they would not instigate persecution after the temple was destroyed in 70. But the synagogues instigated persecution, and they were left in the provinces where the persecution described in Revelation would take place. Important to keep in mind that very idea. Judaizers would have been non-existent after 87. Remember the Judaizers? Probably the initial thorn in the flesh of the church from a from a every day, every kind of week idea. Remember, who were the Judaizers? Who were those folks? What, did, what were they doing? How were they creating havoc? Yeah. Yeah, these are ones that had become Christians, but they really weren't converted. Anybody ever know somebody that, that obeyed the gospel? They were baptized. But they really weren't converted in their heart and mind. Well, these were the first century Judaizers, and they still had that proud uh, Hebraic idea in their minds and their hearts. And they were compelling those that were becoming Christians that they had to keep part of the law in order to become a Christian. The Judaizers. Well, Judaizers 
so it is said by those that date the book early, would have been non-existent after AD 70. No, they wouldn't be. They were just not necessarily confined to Jerusalem. That they would be non-existent is merely an unproven assertion. I would think just the opposite. Their kind probably grew for a while. There is an idea that chapter 6 and 9 agree that the Jewish state was in existence. See, this is important too, because if it's pre-80-70, then the Jewish state and its rulers are still in power. If it's 80, after 80-70, 80, that was all destroyed, record. Oh, and by the way, just a, maybe an interesting side idea here. There is no, from a... From a, a, an ethnicity point of view, there is no Jew living today that can trace his ancestry back to the 12th tribe. You need to hide that away for future conversation, perhaps. Because all of the Jewish economy, all records, everything. Remember what Jesus said in prediction of, the, of that great destruction? There will not be one stone left where? Upon another. That's utter destruction. Everything was destroyed there. Everything. And that was according to the Lord's will. Jesus took that economy from a spiritual, religious perspective away at the cross. From a practical perspective, and as far as a nation goes, <coughs> That was taken away in 8070. And was it last Sunday night or the Sunday night before when we talked about the nation of Israel from the Bible and modern Israel and how the two are not the same? The Lord made sure about that. The Lord made sure in that great destruction of 8070. But it's interesting to note that there is no discussion of that in the book of Revelation. That can be proven that the temple is still standing, that that specific destruction is coming upon Jerusalem. None of that. It is more widespread, it is more general, and there are certain characteristics of this oppression, of this persecution, that we'll see throughout the book that lends its weigh heavily, I believe, to a Domitian persecution rather than a Neronian one or a Jewish one. All right. Some who hold the early day even say that other apostles than John were alive, as perhaps might be implied by Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. But there are other apostles throughout Scripture. There are false apostles. There are, you know, sometimes words are used in a specific and a general sense. You know, there are evangelists, uh, angel. On and on we could go with lots of those words. Well, guess what another one is? Apostle. What does the word apostle mean? One set with authority. That's all. In the most general, in the most unused sense in the Bible, faithful Christians that take the gospel can be called an apostle. But just like Jesus was called an angel, just like many messengers were called angels, but in the specific sense, Jesus wasn't an angel. In a general sense, you know, you are an angel. You are a messenger of God, but not in the specific sense. And so it is in this highly figurative, apocalyptic book. There are many words like this, and it's quite possible that the word apostle is used in that way. All right. There's, there are other arguments for the early days that we could use. In fact, I've got about 26 listed here, and I gave you just about seven, so... I'm going to skip over the rest of these. All right. 
Most scholars of all time, generally, and most scholars now, even in the church, agree that the late day is preferred to the early day when you, when you consider it all. In fact, uh, Hendrickson says, we have not found a single really cogent argument in support of the earlier day. The verdict of modern scholarship is that the book was written during the reign of Emperor Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96. And when you look at Irenaeus, Irenaeus is one of these fellows that most religious people call in the group of the church fathers. And they use that word father not necessarily the way that Jesus condemned its use when referring to man in Matthew chapter 23, but only father in the sense that they are the first people in the church. Father that way. So Irenaeus Polycarp. Polycarp would have been probably the most well-known first church father because who was Polycarp's teacher? Yeah, it was John. The one that has been in the book of Revelation, Polycarp. Irenaeus was a contemporary with Polycarp. And you know what Irenaeus says? And no uncertain, clear terms, that it was written in the latter part of the reign of Domitian. There's not even a statement close to that about Nero by any of the church fathers, any of the early writers. Nobody. Nobody. All right. If you would like some more discussion on that, and I think that a lot of the uh, of the, the, the preponderance of the evidence as we go through the text, you're going to see where it is the internal evidence of the book is more of a, of a commission kind of persecution. More of a worldwide than a, a limited persecution. Okay. What next? I want to look real quickly. A, a, a quick snapshot, an overview of the chapters in the book of Revelation. A, a, a little bit of an outline, if you will. And I just, I want you to listen to what these chapters are about. And I think this will help us get a feel for the whole book and what the intent of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit through John and to us today, what, what that would have been. Um, some people say that Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death, is the theme of the book. That is more uh, secondary in my mind. Is the theme of the book, then Revelation 11 15, that the kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of this Christ. That the kingdoms of this world basically are under the auspices and the providential hand and everything that goes on in them with God. And that's the main thing. Yes, being faithful unto death was, was an important part of that. Is that the first indication that this class is over? Yes. <laughs> there has got to be a figurative expression to express extreme dismay for that. <laughs> what I find when I come to it, I'm The main idea is that <clears throat> Christians, because you're suffering this intensely, keep in mind that Rome is not the ultimate <coughs> ruler. The last word will not be spoken by Domitian. God is still on the throne and he's in control. Now, in light of that, be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. See, that's a little more fundamental than even Revelation 2.10. Chapter 1. John, what you see, write a book. Chapter 2, be faithful unto death. Chapter 3, overcome. 
and then you can come over. Overcome your situation in life, and then you can come over Jordan. But you've got to overcome. You can't let the forces of life overcome you. That's choice, right? You either overcome or be overcome. Overcome, chapter 3, and you can come over. Heaven's door is open, chapter 4. Remember those seals and everything? Chapter 5, Jesus is the lion and the lamb. One of our commentaries here. Chapter 6, the martyrs for Christ. Chapter 7, pertaining of the water of life. Chapter 8, the power of prayer. Chapter 9, they didn't repent of their wickedness. Chapter 10, thoroughly digesting the word, eating the book. Remember that idea in the book of Revelation? Um, chapter 11, where I believe that the theme is found. Earthly kingdoms will fade away. The heavenly kingdom will not. Now, there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel that we can relate to Revelation that would fit quite aptly. How about this one in chapter 12? How to defeat the devil. We need to preach from chapter 12, don't we? Because there was this persecution in the first century, it was written, which all books were written to our first century brethren, there is just as much application to this book, and that's why we need to study it today. Because the principles that, are, that stem from that initial persecution are alive and remain and are very clearly seen. Chapter 13, how about this one for a sermon? <laughs> Satan's powerful friend. <clears throat> Chapter 14, blessed are those who die in Christ. Chapter 15, sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. You sing about singing that song when you sing the new song, don't you? Plagues do not hurt God's own people. Chapter 6, earthly plagues. Chapter 17, Rome, the great harlot. Now, if you're an early dater, you think that's the Jews. You think that's Jerusalem. Chapter 18, materialism ultimately dies. Chapter 19, Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of prophecy. Chapter 20, everybody, we can't wait to get to chapter 20 and the binding of Satan. What that means. Chapter 21, the Lamb's Book of Life. And chapter 22, Paradise Regained. Keep that overview in mind. I heard the second buzzer. We must stop. We'll continue.